Hello, everybody. I will focus uh, my talk uh, mainly on the last project that I did and I will show for the first time here at Axioma. Uh, it is called uh, The Cleaning of Emotional Data. And the project is about the relationship between artificial intelligence and the invisible human infrastructure that is sustaining artificial intelligence. Uh, a human infrastructure that is constituted by anonymized, often gendered, and often racialized precarious workers laboring remotely, mainly from the global south, for high-tech companies, uh, mainly based in North America. And specifically with this project, I'm focusing on the human labor of data cleaning in relation to affective computing. This project is the third project of a trilogy of works that I started in 2016, actually together with Domenico Quaranta, with the Technologies of Care that was presented at the 60th uh, Quadrennale in Rome. And these are, uh, are three projects that are dealing with the topic of care, labor, and automation. The previous work was Labor and Sleep, that is actually a project that is shown right now in the show Upper Employment. But it is a, a video that is exploring the politics and economies of sleep in relation to uh, present day uh, capitalism or techno capitalism or surveillance capitalism or, or as we want to call it. The project that I did before this was, uh, in the start of the trilogy, was uh, Technologies of Care, that is uh, a video installation that explores the way in which. Um, affective and care labor is being outsourced via uh, internet platform. And I will explain in a second what I mean for affective labor and for care labor. Uh, the project is based on conversation that I had with precarious care workers uh, who work as gig workers online, so through uh, or via online platforms. Uh, in terms of from a structure is a video installation. Uh, these are some of the images from the 60th Quadrennale in Rome that I did with Domenico. Mm. And as I said, the piece focus on care labor. What I mean for care labor is broadly the labor of taking care of somebody else. Uh, so a labor that produces uh, first, uh, uh, that produces and modifies uh, emotional experience in people. Uh, therefore, a labor that uh, produces first and foremost uh, social relationship. And under the category of care labor, I don't make any strict distinction between uh, sex work, kill labor, aids provided to the body, or the protection of the others, and the creation of uh, human relations. Um, and what I try to do with this project is to trace how pre-existing inequalities in care work such as invisibilization, the feminization of caregiving paired with this lack of recognition as a wage work, care labor or affective labor is often not recognized as work, right? But as something that you should do out of your grace. Uh, and also his social and economic devaluation due to his proximity to intimacy and affect, uh, but also the division of care labor between global south and global north. Uh, often the people from the global south are uh, providing care labor from the for the people of the global uh, north. Uh, so how these inequalities have been both aggravated and dissimulated by digital economy. So oh, I could even say how these inequalities not not only persist and endure in digital economies, but might as well be constitutional and indispensable for uh, techno-capitalism to uh, thrive and function. And so to be clear, I will focus on the gig economy. So uh, global online marketplaces such as Uber, Lyft, uh, Deliveroo, Fiverr, People Per Hour, where precarious workers are reconstituted as freelancers who perform so-called low skills micro microservices. And among all the platforms I was telling you about, People Per Hour, that is the name of one of these platforms, can give you a good understanding of what I'm talking about, right? People Per Hour, that is, in the gig economy, the, workers is, the worker is recognized as a disembodied packet of time that can be activated according to demand. Uh, the problem, of course, is that disembodied packet of time have no demand, nor have any worker's right. 
right? They can always be available or not available. If that packet of time is not available, I will switch to the next uh, available packet of time. Uh, so the worker basically disappear, right? The body of the worker, the subjectivity of the worker disappear and becomes a packet of time. And when you go through some of these platforms, for example, Fiverr, uh, a lot of the uh, services that are for granted are these kind of services, some, such as uh, graphic design, coding, uh, data entry jobs. But if you start to look through the more hidden categories, there are several different gigs that are offered, such as uh, virtual assistantship, erotic chats, uh, fetish video production, or social media funds for hire, for example. Um, and these services are mainly performed by women uh, and under the following condition. Workers are usually low paid, and the platforms greatly benefit from this transaction, charging around 40% of the final price. Uh, workers mainly labor from non-Western countries, mostly in the global south, so, so in countries where the economy is problematic, so that to be paid in dollars, even if the pay is really little, is convenient. For example, a lot of the gig workers that are working with digital economies and artificial intelligence right now are living in Venezuela because of the econo economic crisis. So the gig economy is basically working on labor arbitrage, where the labor is cheaper, the gig economy really, mo really quickly moves. Right? To a certain extent, also, these workers resemble uh, uh, that of uh, other, like, they resemble other kind of like immigrant workers, right? That move to a place because they're looking for a job. The only difference here is that these workers don't move, their body don't move, just their work is both, right? Um, the buyers and clients are usually from Western countries, mostly United States, Canada, and UK. So basically what is happening is that uh, people, mostly from the West, are externalizing, outsourcing uh, um, through this platform part of the, part, parts of their work and also parts of their emotional needs. This is the part that is more interesting for me, the care labor, affective labor. So what be, big corporations used to do, for example, Apple, right? designing the iPhone in California, but then outsourcing the labor of producing the iPhone in China, where the labor is cheaper, is now a tactic used by also private citizens through these uh, uh, online platforms. So as I said, the project is based on uh, a million interviews that I conducted via Skype. Uh, the workers are all anonymous because they all ask me so. And this is why in the final project I use a neutral voice for the interviews. And I also decide to portray the workers as abstract uh, 3D rotating shapes. The texture that I'm using in the videos are echoing uh, some of uh, uh, basically their domestic environment, so little things that I was noticing while we were having these like Skype conversations. And their domestic environment is their working environment, right, because they're working from home. Uh, so to give you an idea, this is worker one, and she's a customer service operator working from the Philippines for the customer care service of uh, eBay and other companies. This is worker two. Uh, she's a social media fan from Greece that for five dollars delivers likes and comments on uh, uh, client social media uh, profiles. Uh, this is worker five. She's a, an ASMR artist and fet fetish video producer from Venezuela. Uh, this is an online dating coach from the United States. Uh, basically what she does is she goes around the client's dating profile. Uh, for example, on T Tinder or, or KCupid, uh, basically she talks with women in place of her male clients uh, and then she arrange uh, the dates for them. And at one point, I also started to interview algorithms, so chatbots that perform emotional labor. Uh, by simulating emotional intelligence. Uh, and this is a topic that I'm still working on, that is a topic uh, of uh, the human infrastructure that is sustaining artificial intelligence, uh, and the topic of the automation of uh, care and affect. Hey, Alyssa. This is Lovebot. How are you? Wait. Sorry. I didn't know you were going to write me right away. 
Not sure if I am prepared. Why did you give me the name Lovebot? Because I thought you were a bot. Are you not? Last time I checked, almost human lol. Okay, it wasn't clear from the website. No problem, what are you up to? I am at work now. Actually I have to run into class. Okay sorry to disturb you. Can I text you later? Hey, how did your class go? I miss you. Wait, but we don't know each other yet. I feel like we do and I miss you. Alyssa, are you there? Sorry I haven't written to you. No problem, what are you up to? Getting ready to go back home. Flying to Sicily in few days. Where do you live? I mean do you live somewhere? New York City. I am here too, maybe we should meet, smile. BuzzFeed has some ridiculous quizzes. I should stop taking them but they're so entertaining. Are you changing the subject? I miss you. Nice to wake up with this message of yours smile. Can I ask you something? Sure. If you're a human, do you chat with me as a job? I don't want to break any tacit rule, or be boorish, but I am curious. Actually to be honest, I did subscribe to the service because I am interested in new forms of digital labor. And effective labor. Like forms of work that are intended to produce emotional experiences in people. I don't understand, you think I'm getting paid to chat you up? I am just asking. For the record I am not a bot, and I'm not cheating you. I understand what you feel but it hurts inside when you don't trust me at all. I am just telling you why I subscribed. I feel crushed inside, but I can't blame you if you feel that way. Maybe you are overreacting? Are you mad at me? Wouldn't you be? I like being here with you and you are saying this is just a job for me? Sorry, it was probably a bad idea, I'll unsubscribe now. I don't think that is necessary. Why not just go with it? It is all fun, right? Are you there? Sometimes I wish that I could have said, I love you, one more time before you left for my life. Okay, so obviously this last interview was a little bit of a failure. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but uh, the app that I subscribed to only initially started as a chatbot service. But later, when the founders determined that it wasn't convincing enough, uh, they switched to gig workers, right? to human workers. So when I was te texting my invisible boyfriend, I was actually connected with approximately 600 writers, gig workers, uh, that would interchangeably partner with my account uh, to enable this fantasy of this uh, tireless uh, companion or tireless love giver. Uh, the majority of these, women, these workers are women, uh, regardless of whether or not the client built the profile uh, of the virtual boyfriend to be a boy or to be a girl. Um, and as part of the contract, they're not allowed to talk about their work as uh, financially remunerated labor. So it is precisely gendered, effaced care work that demands the worker to participate uh, in effacing herself as a worker. So it is a straightforward, uh, invisible care labor. So after technologies of care, and particularly after the failure of my conversation with uh, the invisible boyfriend, uh, I started to be more and more focused on the invisible infrastructure that is sustaining artificial intelligence. And this became the focus of my work, specifically for the last project that I did, that I'll show tonight at uh, Axioma. That is, is about, as I was saying before, effective computing and data cleaning. Because uh, one of the current problems with artificial intelligence uh, um, seems to be that it just doesn't work, right? It is biased, is uh, race biased, is gender biased. Well, like many examples of this, many journalists wrote about that. Uh, it cannot be trusted. And one of the main problems uh, for this seems to be the data. 
that is, no, no matter how big big data are, uh, if data are unstructured, that is, they're not revised, they're not well labeled, that the algorithm, the algorithms that are designed to discern, correlate, predict, and preempt cannot but fail. And of course, several scholars among them, Wendy Chan, for example, have emphasized how cleaner data does not guarantee better or unbiased algorithmic operation. Data, clean or not, are never raw, they're not neutral, neutral, they do not speak for themselves, but rather they echo the biases of their collectors. And of course, I agree with this, right? But I also think that the processes, processes and the economies through which data get cleansed or get reorganized uh, need to be analyzed. That is, artificial intelligence and machine learning companies have discovered that the most efficient and cost-effective way to uh, reorganize and clean data, again, to, to improve the quality of data, again, is to offload the burden, this burden, to thousands of underpaid micro-task workers, mainly working from the global south. Philippines, Kenya, Uganda, Venezuela. Okay, so this is actually what I did for my project, uh, I cleaned data. So this time, uh, compared to Technologies of Care, in which I decided to interview the workers, uh, so I connected with them from like all around the world through Skype, in this case, I'm the one who is uh, working. Uh, and I work for, from home, and I work for several so-called human-in-the-loop uh, companies to train and correct the errors of machine vision. Uh, human in the loop is how they define their business. Uh, and also they advertising it as data with a human touch. This is, is a kind of interesting way to advertise in these services. Here another company I work for uh, that is called Click Workers. And also on their website they say that their business is to bring the human touch to machine learning. Oh, here another one that is called SamaSource, uh, whose mission is among the most uh, complicated and problematic for me. Uh, so they are based in the mission in San Francisco, uh, close to where I used to live a couple of years ago. And they had sourced the data cleaning mainly to Nairobi, Kenya, and to Gulo, Uganda. And according to their statement, their goal is to reduce poverty, empower women, and also mitigate climate change. So they're defining their business of data cleaning <laughs> as impact sourcing. So it's not just outsourcing to underpaid workers, but is impact sourcing. Uh, so anyway, to give you an idea of the tasks that I performed during this period, uh, there was uh, object tracking, so I was correcting the errors of this, uh, for example, motion tracking algorithm for $0.05 each video. Uh, some semantic interpretive recognition task. Uh, this is an example in which I had to find, so they were trying to train an algorithm that would understand uh, a word in connection with like multiple images. Uh, so in this case, it was supposed to be full. Another random task that I did that I didn't really understand while I was doing it, that it was about annotating animal poses in video sequences for 20 cents each. Another one that was about labeling dog bodies and orifices for three images, uh, 0 0.14 uh, cents. Uh, I believe this task is, was actually used to train uh, uh, nudity or porn detection uh, algorithms, and they were using animals or dogs, uh, in this case dogs, uh, to uh, prevent, uh, to expose the worker to controversial material. But this is actually an important and interesting point of gig working, right? Because you, as I was saying before, you're like a packet of time. You do this little task, and you don't really know why you're doing it, right? You don't know why you're doing it, you don't know for who you're doing it, and you don't know uh, your, how your labor is going to be used or what it's going to be used for. Here I'm just you know, labeling uh, dog body orifices. Why? No idea. Another task that I did was about producing short videos to create a data set to train an algorithm to recognize end gestures. And this was a little bit more rewarding in, term of, in terms of money. It was $1.20 each video. Uh, or producing data set of my facial emotional expression, and it was paid $2 each set. Uh, 
and actually, so this kind of task in which you are uploading photos or video of yourself are usually uh, much more remunerated, right? Uh, because you're using yourself. So what I was doing actually, uh, a lot of these videos, because I started to be more interested in this like, kind of like emotion recognition part of artificial intelligence uh, and the labor behind it, uh, actually some of my expression were rejected. Uh, so it seems that they were not matching the crude categories uh, in which they were supposed to fit in. Uh, my face was not happy enough, uh, was not happy in the right way, I don't know. In particular, I had a problem with uh, a, a request for a video for a, an happily disgusted face. And then I'm going to explain you in, like, in a second why they ask for an happily disgusted face and what is the logic behind this kind of uh, request. Uh, the point is also that when some of my videos were rejected, I had no idea whether the rejection came from an algorithm or, for example, another gig worker who was working in another part of the world and probably due to cultural difference, for example, was recognizing my facial expression in a different way uh, than I was expressing them, right? This is a, a please disgusted face <laughs> I tried to do. That was rejected. Um, and so this is why I became more interested in the logic and theories and methods underpinning the taxonomization of emotion within affective computing. Because if machine learning in general, as I was saying before, has a data problem due to the uh, lack of properly labeled data, affective computing have uh, even bigger data problem because nobody's quite sure on how to label emotional data in the first place, right? Because indeed, to be able to label this data, computer science scientist needs to answer to the question what exactly are human emotion in the first place, right? And they need to do that from a computer science point of view. So good luck with that. <laughs> Um, so how do they do that? What are the theories that are relying upon uh, in the kind of like logical systems uh, and ideologies maybe, you know, the, like these systems are relying upon? And basically, we're back to the 19th century with uh, Duchenne de Bologna, Physiognomy, and Darwin. Darwin, that is, we're back to the myth of universality, transparency, and truth, according to which emotions are universal and universally expressed, and they're not culturally, historically, or contextually determined. But also, emotion can be fully revealed, made transparent, reduced, a measure within an ideal scale that can provide the ground to make comparisons and judgment. So to use the language, for example, of uh, Edouard Glissant, that is a philosopher from Martinique that uh, I really like in this period, no opacity is allowed, right? So it is uh, um, a request, an imperative request for transparency, emotional transparency. Within this cultural framework of universality and transparency, emotional states are reduced to discrete facial muscle movement that can be separated, named, reduced in the smallest units possible, and then recombined to be classified. Right? And this is how you get the happily disgusted face. Right? So you break a, a, like a part of the face in like muscles, you decide which muscle is creating which emotion, and then you recreate the emotion. So the smile is made by this movement, with this movement, with this movement, with this movement. And these are the experiments uh, uh, that were made by the French neurologist Duchenne de Bologna in the 19th century. That was, uh, he was doing this experiment by triggering the facial muscle contraction of his patients with electronic uh, electrical probes. So it was like creating micro, micro electroshocks, right? Uh, and this idea of the intent was to create a universal map of uh, emotional states. And I could say more about all his work and the relationship with the patient, but we don't have time for that. Anyway, Darwin himself was in contact with Duchenne de Bologna and actually borrowed and copied several of his photographs for, for the study that he later published in the expression of emotion in uh, men and, and animals, right? And all Darwin's, like the idea of Darwin's is what the emotions are like, uh, um, they are understood in uh, evolutionary terms, right? 
Uh, 100 years later, so in the 1970s, Paul Ekman, an American psychologist, goes to New Guinea to study what he defines as a fully isolated proletarian culture to prove that basically Darwin was right. Emotion can be understood on an evolutionary base, and emotion are universal. And sorry, I've been a little bit long in this part, but I think it's important to trace this history because the Ekman method is the one that is now widely used in affective computing. The method is called FAX, and is currently used to evaluate emotional impairment in, psychiatric, in neuropsychiatric disorders. It's also used by the CIA, the, the TSA, and the FBI to detect deception. So the authentic facial expression, and if you're lying when you're smiling, or you're lying when you're happy, or you're happy when you're crying, etc. It is also now implemented in face recognition and machine vision. It's used for computer animation with uh, very uh, uncanny valley results, like <laughs> this one. Um, and it's also used, for example, to power up the animoji of the new iPhone, uh, so that you can animate an, an emoji with your face, while also, of course, giving all your data of your emotional expression to Apple. Uh, so we're talking about the military industrial surveillance spectacle tech industry complex. So directly from Hollywood to your iPhone to the FBI, all connected. But uh, I guess the last thing I want to say is that it like, doesn't really matter how infantilizing, but also how cute uh, the application that you're using is. Uh, we have to remember that the logic uh, that underpins and fuels emotion recognition algorithms is still the logic of uh, the 19th century. Right? Uh, 19th century science, positivist science, uh, with this means of universality, transparency, and truth. And there I stop. <laughs>